greetings to all of you. My dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, a warm welcome to all of you from your pastor Yeti. When God Prayed, Chapter 2, The Hour I think it is very important to understand the significance of this specific moment in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. This was no ordinary time. In John 17, 1, Jesus prayed, The hour has come. The time had arrived to bridge the gap between sinful man and a righteous and holy God. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, the levy was breached. The wonderful relationship that had existed between God and man, seen so magnificently in God's fellowship with his creation in the Garden of Eden, was ruptured and rendered useless. Prior to that hour, that was unheard because there was no wakes to pay. But after the breach, the floodgates opened, and from then on that became the persistent drumbeat of every person born voice to die. The wakes of sin had been set in motion. Until this moment, the moment that Jesus sat in the garden and prayed to the Father, the hour has come, Jesus announced. The floodgate was about to be closed once and for all. What exactly did Jesus mean when he spoke of his hour? We will consider this hour from four perspectives. It was an eternal hour. So much can be said about the hour of Jesus' appointment with death. For one thing, it was an eternal hour because it pointed not to any human understanding of time and space, but rather to the sovereign action of a sovereign God who acted before time began. When Jesus announced to the Father that the hour has come, he was not informing God about something he did not already know. This is why we are hearing God pray. This was not a conversation about information. God already knew because he was hearing from himself in the flesh. Yes, Jesus is speaking to the Father in his role and capacity as the Son of Man. But he had not capitulated his nature. Jesus Christ has changed his states, but he did not exchange his existence. When Jesus became flesh, he willingly entered a human time zone. As such, this was a human hour. But he did not cease to exist as God in the fullness sense including God's eternal timelessness. This moment most certainly pinpointed a human element of time and space, while some of Jesus' activities as a boy established the discrepancy between his earthly mission and his heavenly status. The wedding feast at Cana in Galilee was where the differential was clearly seen for the first time in his earthly life and ministry. The biblical account in John 2 tells us that Jesus' mother approached her son immediately when the news was announced that the wedding wine had begun to run out. The predicament was obviously was obvious back in their day wine sellers were unheard of let alone refrigeration. The fruit of the vine was not only in short supply, but when harvested was served with great haste. 
It followed logically that the best wine would have been served at the front end of the wedding. Not the least of reasons because it could spoil. It also was not uncommon that water down the wine in order to offset the sharpness of the taste. And yet as time progressed, the best wine began to run out. The master of ceremonies was entrusted with the responsibility of gradually introducing more and more water so that the supply of wine would last for the duration of the feast. And note that Jesus, that the Lord Jesus did not treat his mother with contempt or rudeness in his question of her. What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? John 2 verse 4. He was establishing his hour that had not yet come within the context of the unfolding of his purpose on earth in application to a human time frame. In this context, Jesus was reminding his mother that everything he was doing was subordinated to his mission. As such, he could have been conversing with the only person who truly recognized him, not as the boy she has raised, but as the promised Messiah and Son of God. And after all, his mother had pondered all these things in her heart. Jesus' phrase, my hour has not yet come, was a constant reference to his pending death and ultimate exaltation to the right hand of God that was read so often about in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. This was the reason no one let a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. God's sovereign plan and timetable for the Lord Jesus would not allow them to touch him until God's appointed time for his son to go to the cross. Later on, Andrew and Philip heard Jesus say, The hour has not come for the Son of Man to be glorified. John 12:23. Here again, he was referring to his death and resurrection. But this time, he was not speaking of the future, as he had always done in the past. And he referred to himself as the Son of Man, which was his favorite designation for himself. Every time he referred to himself as such, he was associating himself not only with the themes of death and resurrection, but also in his capacity as the full revelation of God. It was a human hour. God has always been the God of order, not chaos. From the beginning of time, our Father has orchestrated events and happenings according to his purpose. He works all things together in order to conform us to his plan of actions. You can search Romans 8.28 for that. So while this was most certainly an eternal hour, it was a human hour as well. The unfolding events were chrono uh, chronological. From the time Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he walked the chronology of God's timetable in the footsteps of a man. And every time we visit the land of Jesus' birth, we will follow the way of the cross step by step, station by station, moment by moment. We feel his pain and experience his agony as he prays in the garden. We all hurt because his disciples fell asleep and could not wait for him. And now the hour had come. It was a sacrificial hour. This moment in time also represented the hour of Jesus' greatest sacrifice. Most certainly, he had sacrificed to an extreme by laying aside his glory. Most certainly, he had sacrificed to an extreme by coming, becoming human flesh. But the climatic moment of his sacrifice was approaching, and he knew it. When he prayed, we are listening to the heart cry of the Son of Man being confronted with the reality of his impending agony. And much earlier, 
Jesus set the stage. Jesus replied to them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I assure you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces a large crop. The one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant also will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour, but that is why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. John 12, 23 to 28. Wow! The hour of sacrifice was approaching when Jesus replied to his disciples in this context. But now, has he prayed? It was here. In the former encounter, we find our Savior connecting the fact of his impending death to the principle of Christian discipleship. For just as the sown kernel dies to bring about a rich harvest, so the death of the Son of God will result in the salvation of many. But has he application but as the application of the fact of his death is made, so too is the application to all who follow him in willing obedience. They may have to be willing to lose their lives for his sake and both services to him and witness for him. Remember his words shortly after his formal commissioning of the disciples. Therefore, everyone who will acknowledge me before man, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before man, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Don't assume that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I came to turn. A man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and the man's enemies will be the members of his household. The person who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The person who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone finding his life will lose it, and anyone losing his life because of me will find it. Matthew 10, 32-39 Implicit in Jesus' explanation of Christian discipleship is the hard cry of his troubled soul. The term he used now my soul is troubled, provides a key insight into our Savior's emotional dilemma as he looked to the heavens in this sacrificial hour. The term itself is strong and indicates horror, anxiety, and even agitation. The mere thought of having the endured the suffering and shame of the cross was enough to cause the Son of Man severe pain and anguish. It was the overriding purpose of the hour that sustained the Lord Jesus. It was a sovereign hour. While I would never try to line up an order of priority as to the meaning of Jesus' words, for they are all vital to our understanding of this conversation. I do believe we cannot ignore the significance of the sovereignty of God that was at work as Jesus prayed. In short, God in his sovereign wisdom constructed the ministry of reconciliation because of his divine love and by his matchless grace. The biblical account of the events and circumstances surrounding Jesus' trial and execution definitely present a picture of marauding crowds glamouring for his blood. The rulers of the Jews must have thought 
they had accomplished much when they forced Pilate to acquiesce to their pitiful demands. Had the Roman authorities empowered them to order the execution of whomever they choose to execute, Pilate would hardly have been necessary. And yet, despite all of this, they were still marching to the drumbeat of God, although those who screamed for the blood of the Savior probably went home after Jesus' death and bragged to their friends and family about how successful they had been in bringing Jesus to justice. They were right in line with God's perfect timing. In reality, they were irrelevant. Years later, Paul contextualized this issue. The Corinthian Christians were giving a stark reminder of their own human irrelevancies when Paul put it like this, From now on, then, we do not know anyone in a purely human way. Even if we have known Christ in a purely human way, yet now we no longer know him like that. And therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. All things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Now everything is from God. We reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ. God was reconciling the world to him, self, not counting their trespasses against them, and he had committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 16-21 Ultimately, this was the hour to which Jesus referred. It was God's hour, planted by God, designed by God, carried out by God through the person and work of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This was the moment of sovereign power when <clears throat> alienated man would be permitted to full reconciliation with God in Christ. This hour was the in Christ moment, two words that carry the entire redemptive plan for man. Herein lies ultimate security for all believers, because the Lord Jesus Christ bore in his body the judgment of a righteous God and on sinful man. This is the only means by which all believers are accepted by God. And furthermore, the hour had come whereby God would guarantee passages into heaven for eternal life. And let's not underestimate the unbelievable accusations involved in becoming a new creation in Christ. In a sense, we hear God the Father speaking forth from the throne of His righteousness. From this hour on, All people from whom my son will die will be totally forgiven of all sin, will be guaranteed a place in heaven with me forever, and will be granted all the rights and privileges I have conferred upon the one in whom I am well pleased. The key, of course, to Jesus' hour of that lies in these verses because They summarize the heart of the gospel message in two ways, God's imputed righteousness and Jesus' substitutionary death. God's imputed righteousness. This was the hour at which God would no longer count the sins of man against him. The hour he was speaking of not only pointed to the actual activity related to his death, on the cross, but also to the resultant action it produced. Herein lies the heart of the doctrine of justification, which basically tells us that when we repent of our sins and place our faith 
and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, God declares the repentant sinner righteous because he has been covered by the sacrifice of Jesus. This is how we become reconciled to God. Jesus substitutionary death. Even though Jesus himself knew no sin, he took on himself the sin of the world and became sin of the world. Here we see God the Father using the principle and action of imputed righteousness in treating his son as though he was a sinner, even though he was not. That is why he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. The hour to which Jesus referred was a sovereign hour because God made it that way according to his plan from before the foundation of the world. The hour of his death saw God the Father regarding Jesus, his son, as if he were a sinner, even though he was not. As a result, he had Jesus die as a substitute in order to pay for the sins of all who would come to place their faith and trust in him as their personal Lord and Savior. In that very moment of that very hour, God exhausted his anger against sin by taking it out on his beloved son on the cross. And because of Jesus' substitutionary role in paying the price for our sin, the righteousness that is credited to the believer's accounts is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, who bore their sins so they would bear his righteousness. This my beautiful people, is why Jesus asked the Father to glorify him. What a powerful moment do we have here when God prayed. My dear ones, he died for us. He died for us. Take it very serious in your life. Let God love you with His precious, compassionate love for you. Jesus Christ, who bore your sins, that you could bear His righteousness. Amen, my dear ones. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. This is your pastor, Yadi. I love you guys.